Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. I am John Schmelk, joined by friend of the program, joins us every year around this time, the one and only Charles Davis. Uh, he, of course, does games for CBS. He does uh, the draft work for NFL Network. NFL Network has their coverage of the draft, of course, next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from Detroit. Charles will be a big part of that. Charles, rocking your New York, New Paul sweatshirt from your high school days. Good to see you, my friend. Always great to see you. Tough season last year for the Huguenots, coming off of a great season the year before. Hopefully we can get back on the upward trajectory. But you know something? As we say in New Paltz, we're not Highland. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, just for everyone, that's our that, that when I was in school, that was our big rival, one town over. So anytime you had that one, you know, that's your that's your blood feud, right? That's your Alabama, Auburn, your, you know, your Tennessee, Alabama, that's your you Springfield know, and Shelbyville, Eagles. if you will. Thank you, Giants, Eagles, wherever it is that's your big rival. That was ours, although on the football field during our time, not much of one. Anyway, moving right along. All right. And that was good. <laughs> Sadly, Charles, uh, the Giants didn't have a very good year last year either, and they're trying to figure out how to move on and rebound from that. So before we get into draft prospects, let's talk about the Giants themselves here and, and your view. They like Daniel Jones enough to give him a big contract two off or last offseason, right? But last year didn't go well, but it was a really small sample size, right? He only played in six games. One was really good against Arizona. Uh, he played in halves of two others. So it was basically like four games that, frankly, were bad. But you yep. played against really good opponents, Cowboys, 49ers, Dolphins, uh, go down the list. Yeah. And he didn't have his left tackle for pretty much all those games. He didn't have Saquon Barkley for three of those games. But the Giants are in a position here to perhaps draft a guy that they think is special at the position. So if you were in the Giants' decision-making chair here, how would you approach this in regards to whether or not you're going to either pick a quarterback at six or even maybe move up for one, depending on what the situation is? That's such a great question, John. It really is because to me, it's the one that, you know, when you start to take a good look at Joe Shane, general manager, Brian Dable, head coach, all the scouting department, right? Everyone under Joe Shane, the coaching staff, especially those on the offensive side of the ball who have the most decision making to do meeting with Brian Dable and trying to come to a consensus on what it, what is going on. But the one piece that I didn't throw in there is running that up the food chain to Mr. Mara. Because at a certain point, you've got to know with his blessing what your direction is, okay? Listen, guys, if you draft a quarterback right there at six, or you even move up, but let's say we decide there's a guy we want, we're going to make that move, we're going to go get him. Mr. Mara's got to articulate what his vision is of what that means to him. Meaning, hey, if you're going to do that, I believe that means that's extra time for what this program needs in order to get going. Because let's be honest about it. The CJ Stroud effect of last year with Houston, that's few and far, be far between, right, John? You and I have been around a block once or twice, okay? Not as many times as others, not as few times as some. Generally, right? rookie quarterbacks don't go to the playoffs, George. Charles. Generally, they don't it's go to the playoffs. Goes. They're not going to the Pro Bowl. They're not doing. Like Matt Ryan went to the playoffs at 11-5. and five. What year was that? <laughs> and I'm not saying there's been no one in between. I'm just saying what hits my head is not readily apparent. Oh, yeah, well, you put a rookie quarterback in, you guys are golden. It doesn't really work that way. So that's something Mr. Mara's got to be able to articulate about how he feels about Joe Shane, how he feels about Brian Dable and the direction of the franchise, the whole deal, because to me, that's what dictates it. If he's in that meeting and they go, hey, we're thinking really hard about doing it this way. And he has said on record, quarterback is something that he would consider and entertain but i think you've got to lay out what your vision is about what that means because the flip side is he may say you know i know where you guys are going with it but i don't, don't like it you better get some players and win me some ball games this year that would be a really good idea now if it goes to that then you're rolling with daniel jones you're trying to supplement and fortify around him and the one thing we do know john in this league you can get right a lot quicker than what people think we see it all the time. People put some things together, get on a run, boom, you're off and going. Look, two years ago, the Giants, that roster should never have been in the playoffs. I'm sorry. It just never should have been in the playoffs. But it was. Exactly. 
and John Mara has said he would, if they want to get a quarterback, he'd be fine with that. He'll obviously, and this is how he operates, right? He's going to let the general manager and the head coach make their decision, and he's going to back what they do. I guess the way I've been putting it, Charles, is your decision as to whether or not you draft a quarterback almost has nothing to do with your evaluation of Daniel Jones, right? Because you made that decision two years ago. You have the injury factor, which is why we're having this conversation at all, right? And if you think one of these guys is special, and when I say special, I mean a guy that you can put on a field with Joe Burrow or Patrick Mahomes or Justin Herbert, and again, not right away. At some point, they have the tools to develop into that guy that can compete with those superhuman type of quarterbacks. Then that's something any team in the NFL would have to consider that doesn't already have one of those big time guys, right? So I guess yes. my question for you is of this group of quarterbacks, which one of these guys or more than one of these guys, aside from Caleb Williams, who obviously is going to be off the board at one, has it in them to become one of those superhuman superstar level quarterbacks at some point? Well, I think the one that the league feels and the one that I've evaluated evaluating on tape is the one out at USC and he's not going to be available. That's Caleb Williams. Now we're getting into the rest of it. Jaden Daniels, who had an extraordinary season at LSU. Once again, he's one of those. And we, you and I have talked about this for how many years now, who are these quarterbacks that just rose their last year. And all of a sudden here we are. Used to be that wasn't something that we addressed and embraced. We used to be very suspicious of a late rise of a quarterback. Well, Jaden Daniels, it's not just a late rise. It was three years at Arizona State, one year at LSU that was pretty good, and then last year was whoosh, off he went. So I thought he was developing all along. That part was cool. Drake May's a redshirt sophomore, so we only got two years on tape. But, boy, does he look good when you see – you know, as, as my colleague Bucky Brooks would, has, has taught me, when you evaluate, evaluate the flashes. Well, the flashes of Drake May are really good, okay? They're, They're good. Ooh, I love that, right? Now the J.J. McCarthy thing kicks in at Michigan. Did we see enough of the flashes? Did we see enough of the things we want to see? Well, guess what? I think we did. It was all on tape. I've likened him to C.J. Stroud where we had the same questions with C.J. Stroud last year. Are they the same type of a player? I don't think so meaning they have some differences in how they go about doing things. But the same questions we asked of C.J. Stroud last year, we're asking of J.J. McCarthy this year. And remember last year, it was all there on tape. You just had to go find it. I think the same thing is true with McCarthy this year. So all that being said, John, back to your original question, all of them, I think, can be a quarterback for you to carry into the future. All of them can be your franchise guy, but you're going to have to go about it a little bit differently with each and every one of them. Because you mentioned... Mahomes, Burrow, those guys, right? The, the you know the, the 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 top of the food chain guys. Are we ready to put Brock Purdy there? Because the 49ers got to the Super Bowl last year and had their chances to win the Super Bowl last year with Brock Purdy, who did things better than we expected. But are we still thinking to ourselves? And is anyone out there still saying, "Well, you know, some eliminate that, put Purdy up there"? I think he's a terrific quarterback. But if I'm saying head-to-head -head with Burrow, Mahomes, Josh Allen, those guys, I'm saying no. No, he's not that guy. Everything around him is pretty darn good, and he maximizes that. Is that who J.J. McCarthy is? Is that who Drake May is? Is that who Jaden Daniels? That's what the scouts have to determine. That's where it all comes down. Because with Daniel Jones, you keep mentioning it, John, and, and I'm with you. It hasn't been a true fair sample for him because – who has he thrown to in his time with the Giants, let alone who's protected him in his time with the Giants? That's made it very, very difficult. I'd love to see him have a full sample with a roster that you go, oh, that's, that's a pretty good roster. Let's see what happens with Daniel Jones now. And then at six, if you decide not to go quarterback, so let's move on to the next part of this then, right? And, and then we'll talk about maybe if you want to attack that on day two, we can have that discussion. Yeah. You talk about who the guys he's throwing to, right? He's got a bunch of guys. And the way I'm looking at this, Charles, you have Darius Slayton, Jalen Hyde, and Wanda Robinson. On the surface, you're like, all right, those are some solid receivers. But if you put those three guys around a true number one, then you're like, oh, well, Jalen Hyatt is like a second option speed guy. That looks a lot better than him as your primary. Wanda Robinson is a slot guy that you can't focus on because you have a true X out there. Ooh, that looks really, that looks much better to me. So, you have a chance to get one of these three wide receivers. To me, that's a force multiplier for the entire wide receiver group and, in the end, the entire offense. 
and I think what you're saying, and tell me if I'm wrong, because I want to make sure I'm getting this right, John. What you just said there is Kansas City last year or the last two seasons, essentially. Yeah. Because who the quarterback was. What Kansas City essentially said over the last two seasons is we may not go all out receiver wise. We'll get you decent guys. Maybe some guys potentially do a few things, but we're counting on you. The guy wears number 15 on his jersey. You make it all better. You make it all work. And there aren't many guys that can do that in this league, by the way. Exactly. But that's kind of what they've done. And what they did was they got better on defense. Mm -hmm. Because you and I, okay, let, let, let's say, tell me again if I'm wrong, John, because again, I hate putting words in other people's mouths. That I don't want you to just go, and surely you'll agree with me. Okay, I don't want to say that at all. But what I am saying is over these last two years, in my opinion, Kansas City did such a good job of saying, okay, Patrick, you take this and fix it. Okay, make it all work for us. And here's how we'll meet you halfway. We'll take our defense and take them from playing with a 14-point lead to being a defense you can win with if you play quarterback a certain way. And they did. All right? The last couple of seasons, C. Spagnuolo helped transform that defense from one that's like, we'll go sick them when we're up 14 because our offense is zooming, to now our offense plays off of us. Patrick Mahomes takes a sack instead of trying to make a hero play. They run the ball on third and eight and pump the football for field position because our defense is pretty darn good. Patrick Mahomes says to himself, I'm not throwing the ball into double coverage, even though I've got the arm to do it because I don't want to put my defense in a tough spot where now they got to take over on a sudden change on our side of the field. He played quarterback at a level that he had never played it before. And I know what people are saying. The numbers, the number, forget the numbers. I'm talking about understanding who your team is, understanding how to manage a game correctly, understanding what it's going to take to win on that particular day that you're playing that opponent. Patrick Mahomes went to Apex Predator as a quarterback last year. That's what you're talking about doing with different teams and how you're trying to get around them. Because San Francisco played to their defense as well. Let's be honest about the whole thing. Although on offense... They put up more points than Kansas City did. Yeah, and I think if you add that number one, because look, not many quarterbacks can do that, right? That what Patrick Mahomes could do. And I think to 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 give, if you're sticking with Daniel for this year, to give this Giants offense a chance to compete, right? I think if you have a chance to add that number one wide receiver to the room, it would elevate everything going on around them. How do you have those top three guys stacked on your board, Charles? You know, on mine, I, I love neighbors, uh, you know, but, you know, hair. Uh, See, what happens is I've got guys who are, to me, the clear one. Quarterback is Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr. at Ohio State. Because we're in that nitpicking time. Yeah. We're almost close to coming back around to, oh, yeah, that's right, Marvin Harrison's the top receiver. We're getting close. We're almost there. To me, he's the number one guy. Neighbors is two. Not a monster gap by any stretch of imagination. And right now, let me I'll put it this way, John. If somehow this gets to Malik Neighbors, He's going to want to put a Cobra clutch on me. He is the, you talk about a competitor and he sees slights everywhere. And if you tell him he's not this, like he lost a Blitnikoff award last year by like one or two votes or whatever it was. And my man wanted to just take everybody out who didn't vote for him. He translates that into on the field play. So to me, Neighbors is the next guy out of LSU, just a fierce, monstrous competitor. I'm telling you, malevolent out when he runs routes. My next guy is Roma Dunze out of Washington. Another monster competitor, uber, I mean, just oozes out of him where he wants to get after it. Not quite as fast, I don't believe, as Harrison and Neighbors, but everything else you want. I mean, we were at the combine, John. I think he's still back there trying to get his three cone drill on <laughs> top of the of lights, only because he was competing with himself. He wasn't competing with anyone else. He's like the best golfers in the world. You go play the course, shoot your number, and see if anybody can deal with that. You don't have to play against anyone else because you're one of a very few people, and that's what a Dunze is for me. But there's so many other receivers in this draft. We'll see how it all breaks down and goes. But if the, if the Giants want to go at six and get one of those top guys, I think the way the board's going to fall, they may very well have second pick of the top receiver group. Maybe even first pick, depending on what Arizona does it for, because Monty Austin for their GM, his phone is wide open right now. Call me. Call me. What you and, got? and by the way, I think the Chargers are the same way, right? I could see both of them. Oh, I know Joe Ortiz there. is. I know Joe Ortiz, a new GM coming in because they're cap strapped. 
right? They are, he's got to get through this season cap wise before he can go back and be the full GM he wants to be. I mean, not, why is Keenan Allen not there? You and I both know why. And Mike it's, Williams, same thing. Right? Mike Williams coming off of injury cap again. Joe's got to get that cap managed the right way. So, yeah, he'd be happy to listen to you if you want to call him at five. So that's two teams now that we're talking probably people coming up trying to get to a quarterback area. Well, guess what? You may very well have first pick of the, those receivers that are out there. And, boy, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Final question to the top, Charles. I, I don't think I actually got your stack. So – was it the order you listed him at, at quarterback? Harris, Daniels, Harris, May, Harris, May, McCarthy. Harris. How about oh, quarterback? Quarterbacks: Williams, Daniels, May, McCarthy. There's a lot of chatter about McCarthy being the second guy off the board now. I mean, you're hearing it, right? It's it, crazy. It, to, to, honestly, it, Charles, to it, me, it's crazy. I, 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 don't, I, I, I look, and, and I like. I did not think I, I was like, gonna like McCarthy's tape, but when I watched the tape, I'm like, all right. I, I see the, the, you know, third and seven, third and 10, you know, a lot of stuff over the middle accurate, but I, you know, he throws a bit of a flat ball for me. I don't like the vertical stuff all that much. I, I just can't put him up there in the same category as Daniels and may. I don't see that same to your point though. I don't see as many flashes of the super high level play as I do with the other two guys. The flashes are there. You're not going to see as many of them. And I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. I'm just saying no, I, what hundred percent encapsulating. They are all there. You're not going to see as many, partly because of how they went about their, their business. You talk about old school offense now. Line up and beat you up. Okay. We would just, okay. I just saw Creed two or three or whatever where he fought Drago's kid and the whole thing, right? And guess what? I will break you. Came up again in the movie. That's how they went about their business at Michigan. I will break you. And never in my life, John, you and I have grown up in the Northeast. Did you ever think you'd watch a Penn State team in the second half of a Big Ten football game, of any ball game, that someone ran it 28 times and officially threw zero passes and beat you on your home field? What they do. That's what, that's what Michigan did last year, which is one of the reasons we don't see as many things from McCarthy as we'll see from other people. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? Absolutely. Giant Soto Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Question about Michael Penix for you, Charles. We know about yeah. the health issues with him, right, and the medicals, which we don't know anything about. So let's kind of push that aside. <laughs> Based solely not, on your, you're not going to play a doctor on TV. That's a no, good idea. I, I, I am not. So let's push that aside. Simply based on what you've seen on tape, if if yeah. he had a, a spotless medical record, where would you have him, and what would be your evaluation of him in terms of when you think he would jump off the board? Spotless medical record. We're in there with the fist fight about you know, do we have a stack of five instead of four? Because the last two years have been awfully good. Okay. I think that when you have a medical question that comes into play with all the injuries he had at Indiana, now his side's going to say, don't forget, the last two years at Washington, he answered the bell every single time, and he did. And last year, he played almost an NFL season because of the college football playoff, and he answered the bell every time. Yeah. See, once you start bringing medical into it, you know what else I think happens? I think psychologically, you start to pick more nits on the player. Because you don't want to fall in love with a medical guy, right? So you try and find other things. And you mentioned McCarthy and 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 the flat ball that he that he throws in your in your evaluation. How many times you heard that about Penix? Okay, he's got a big but time arm, man. Whew. Monster arm, and the feet don't always have to be set for that monster arm to still operate. And I think he showed a lot of poise. I think he showed a lot of toughness and leadership as he's gone along. Um, look. Sometimes we, 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 you know, we get into stuff and, and, and things we will take and put to the side with some people, other people will bring to the, for, to the front. I don't think that we should ever discount this head to head to twice with Bo Nix last year. Big ball games, big games. And those two went at it and they were really good. Penix's team won both times and Penix was a big factor in doing so. So I don't want to discount that, you know, he's going to rise up in the big moments in play. 
The medical is going to scare the heck out of a lot of people. And you and I both know, John, it's team to team. Sure. Because we have Leate Latu, the, the great edge rusher who's in it. The University of Washington wouldn't clear him. He ends up getting at going to UCLA, working with a doctor, getting cleared and playing since then. So we've seen this many, many times. Each team has their own risk that they're willing to take on a medical guy. That's what's going to be the question for Penix because, John, I'm just I'm going to leave it at this. He's good enough that he's a first round candidate, and the way quarterbacks come off the board, he could very well go. Okay, we see it all the time, right? Christian Ponder got pushed up to 12. EJ Manuel went at 16. We can do this all day long. But there's a big thought in me that says, if it goes the way it's supposed to go, he goes in the second round with Bo Nix. Fair enough. I have had trouble, Charles, parsing the running back position in this draft class. I have like six or seven guys with very similar grades as, you know, yeah. early third round type of picks. Who are the guys you like? Who are your favorites that, that, that you just watch and you go, you know what? I feel like this guy is going to be a good NFL player. I'm going to give you two who don't have a lot of tread on the tire, but one's coming off of an injury, and that's what the issue is. It's Jonathan Brooks at Texas. Because he had eight career starts, and all eight came last year before he got hurt because he was behind B. John Robinson, Roshan Johnson, all of those guys. But when he got his opportunity, he was, he, was spe- he was special out there, okay? Down the stretch, I think he had five 100-yard games and a 200-yard game, six games out of eight. <laughs> that were pretty darn good, right? Gets hurt. Now he's come off the ACL. We know that that's going to set him back. Probably not going to go as high in the draft as he should, but I really like him. The other is Jalen Warren, who didn't touch it that much at Tennessee. All right? He's not a bell cow back. Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright, right? No, excuse me, Jalen Wright. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. My, my fault. Not nah, all good. The Pittsburgh guy? Yeah, Pittsburgh? Jalen Warren's the Pittsburgh running back. Trust me, uh, I, I get these names flopped all the time too, man. Don't worry my, about my it. My apologies, especially my apologies to my fellow volunteer. But his yards per carry last year was like seven. All right, when he yeah. touched the ball, he he moved it and got it done. And he didn't have a ton of carry, so I kind of like that about him. I feel yeah, like he has some like Devon A-Chain in him a little bit, that, that, that type of player. Yeah, now A-Chain, of course, when he just hits, boom, when he hits go. That's frightening, right? War- Wright has a little bit of that in him as he goes. I don't know if he's quite as sudden as A-Chan. That's a whole different <laughs> whole different category, but I like where the comparison is on that. So those are my top two in terms of the reasons why I like them. Trey Benson's another one. Injury in Oregon, not many carries, goes to Florida State. I asked him how he got to Florida State. He said Mike Norvell recruited him hard when he was head coach at Memphis State. And there was a trust factor. I liked what I liked before. Come on down here. You'll have an opportunity. Boy, did he take advantage of that opportunity. I really like him as as a heck of a player. I think once the running back run begins, and it'd be interesting to see where it starts, because you mentioned third round. Once it starts, I think it's going to go, 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 go. But I also have that feeling that someone's going to take the back they like earlier than that. And I don't think it'll trigger the run. It'll just be this team. Like Jameer Gibbs last year. Remember when he went at 12 to Detroit? Everybody's like, oh, my God. Well, if you really like a guy, just go get him. Don't worry about the rest of it. But those are guys that I like a bunch. Like Bucky Irving's a good back out of Oregon. Slight, a little more of a slight build. Quicker than fast, as I discovered at the combine. Because when I watched him run, John, I thought he was like a 4-4 guy. He ran like 4-5-6 yeah. at the combine. But the quickness and the change of direction – it's all there. Those are some of the guys that I would throw out there. Please throw me some more names because, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of these running backs. No, there are. Look, I uh, I like Dre Davis out of, out of, out of uh, Kentucky. I think he's a guy oh, that, you know, you. nothing thank nothing you. jumps thank out where it's like, oh, wow, thank that you. shot. But he just does everything well. He does. And he's also, you're going to hear this. Ad, if you haven't heard it ad nauseum already, you're written close to ad nauseum. Thousand yards at three different schools. Correct. Well, let's make sure we get it. Let's make sure we get it right. It's a thousand career yards at three different schools because he didn't get a thousand yards in a season at Temple. But he had two seasons there, so he went over a thousand yards. Thousand yard season at Vanderbilt, thousand yard season at Kentucky last year. And you know, there were some Benny Snell traits there, weren't there? Remember what they called it at Kentucky when Benny Snell was there? They called it Benny Snell football. Yeah. Because the stretch, they would just grind you and, and, and run it. Plug in the Florida tape last year, Kentucky, Florida. That was Ray Davis football with well over 200 yards in that one. 
The other guy I really like that, I, don't, I think because he hasn't participated much, Charles, in the post-draft process because of injury, I think Will Shipley out of Clemson is an awesome running back. He can catch it. He can. I know he's not the biggest guy in the world, so maybe he's not an 18-carrier game type of guy. But he's elusive. He can catch it. He's quick. I, I think he's you know more than fast enough to to pull away. I, I think Shipley, a guy, just because, again, he's been hurt, is a guy that a lot of people haven't talked enough about. Agreed. And his style of play, run between the tackles, run to the perimeter, catch it out of the backfield, stand in the pocket and protect your quarterback. It translates to me to be a good player in the NFL. Remember how I was telling you about the guys I like because there wasn't much tread on the tire? There's a lot of tread off the tire with Will because he had a lot of use at Clemson, okay? So that's going to be something people are going to be evaluating and going. Because, you know, one of the reasons Derrick Henry went in the second round at Alabama was people were wondering if he could get that, four, you know, that big body going fast enough in the NFL to have an effect. And as we learned, yes, he, yes, he could. But he didn't have full-time running back use at Alabama until his last year. That's when he got all of his carries. That's when he got the 2,000 yards. That's when it all happened. Prior to that, he was always with a two- or three-person rotation system. Will Shipley hasn't had as much of that at Clemson. When he's on the field, he's on the field. Oh, and again, he's on the field. A lot like Christian McCaffrey at San Francisco. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. Named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by the Banker. As the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the Huddle, Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at CitizensBank.com. Joined by Charles Davis here from NFL Network. You can find them on Path to the Draft over the course of the week, the next couple of weeks. And, of course, he is part of their live coverage of the draft in Detroit uh, Thursday to Friday. I believe it's April 25th to the 27th. So make sure everybody go and check that out. Uh, Charles, day two... Guys up front on defense. The Giants are always trying to shore this up. They make the big Brian Burns move last year, but they lose Leonard Williams, right? If you, Everyone thought this would be a great top of the draft class, a defensive tackle. I don't think it's turned out that way. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get two first-round defensive tackles. But I do think there are a lot of choices on, on day two uh, that can play that three-technique position next to Dexter Lawrence. That's what the Giants are trying to kind of fill here. Who are some of the guys you like that play that spot on day two? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to go to my notes on this one. Nope, okay? Note it up. Let's do it. Right. Okay. I'm going to go to my notes because this is an open book test. I'm glad you did that for me, Professor. But you mentioned the two first round guys. You got to be talking about Byron Murphy at Texas and big Johnny, Johnny Law, Johnny Newton at, at, at Illinois. Jerzon Newton goes by Johnny. After that, we're starting to get into a whole bunch of guys. Chris Jenkins out of Michigan. Although he's not built nearly as big as his father, he's still more than big enough and did a nice job for the national champions inside. Devondre Sweat is your plus, plus, plus size defensive tackle. Plus, we plus, plus, combine, plus, 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 plus. Right? He got on the scale of 366 and went, went thundering down on the 40, but also shows some movement skills in there. You know you're not going to run it past him on the point of attack. If you're looking for a run stuff for McKinley Jackson at Texas A&M, it's kind of Tavondre Sweat light, if you're going to call 300-plus pounder light. Okay? All right, so if I'm being, being kind of funny with the words there, I'm going to give you a guy that I, I really like. Is Braden Fisk. I love him out of Florida State. And it's going to be very interesting at the bottom of the first, top of the second, who values what he brings to the table. Because we watched him all week at the combine, and he did all the same things when he went back and watched on tape. The number of times that you see Braden Fisk rush a passer and then turn and peel and go get involved with the tackle after a pass downfield or a quarterback run or whatever – it's 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 unbelievable watching what he does. We call it retracing for defensive linemen. He retraces better than anyone else in this draft, but the extra hustle and effort to be involved helps him make a lot of plays. And Mason Smith, and it's M-A-A-S-O-N from LSU, kind of making a move in this draft process is people, someone that we like a little bit more. So we're starting to get into a whole bunch of guys like that. Um, but I'm going to give you one that I think is a third rounder that I'm yeah. really, really crazy about, and that's Rook. Oh, row, 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 out of Clemson. Because when you pop in the tape, you're there to watch Tyler Davis, his teammate, who went to the senior bowl, and he's a good player. But number 33 just keeps flashing for you, keeps showing up. Guy right in there. And by the way, he's only going to get better when a defensive line coach gets a hold of him and add to his pass rush move. Yeah, he hasn't played very, he hasn't played football very long, right? 
No, not very long at all. But I'm just telling you, I think once you start getting into the third round or so, I think he's a guy that I would keep my eye on in a big way. Now I'm with you 100%, Charles. And I know DB play is near and dear to your heart. The Giants right now, I don't know who their second and third cornerbacks are. I guess right now it's Cordell Flott and Nick McLeod. I think you can look to add to that room next to Deontay Banks. And they didn't really add a safety other than Jalen Mills to, you know, buttress what they have next yeah. to Jason Pinnock with Xavier McKinney leaving. So you can go through those two spots. Again, re reference your notes. You got corner and oh. safety day two and day three. Because look, the Giants only have two day two picks. And yep. Lord knows if they end up trading up, they not, might not have any day two picks, depending on how this goes, right? So just, just give me some day two and three DBs that really have caught your eye during this process. I'll start with the safeties, John, because we're hearing a lot of chatter that linebacker and safety are not first round positions. Now, somebody's going to fool us, right? There's always somebody who likes someone better than what we know, and they take them, and, and off we go. But right now, those don't seem to be spots of priority for anyone in the league. My favorite safeties, Cole Bishop from Utah. Love him. Crazy about, absolutely crazy about. Can he play the high safety? Yes, he can. And if so, he'll clean up anything that comes through to his spot. But he really does his best work down low, right? Gets down into the box area, makes a lot of plays on the ball, Knocks the ball free from people. And by the way, I think he got everyone's attention. We're at 4 4 5 at the combine. I'm not sure how many people saw that part coming. Guess what? Add that to the back to the Bix and off you go. Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota. I say this every year. Whatever they're doing up there, PJ Fleck, on the defensive side of the ball, coaching the secondary, I want a piece of it because the instincts of their defensive backs that come out and how they make plays on the ball is consistent when we talk about a Minnesota defensive back. And this year's Tyler Newbin, the safety, another one who's similar to Antoine Winfield, ball magnets, as we like to call them, right? He shows up around the football, makes plays on it, gets into the passing lanes, tackles well. He would be a guy that I think that you got to take a good hard look at. If you want a pure strong safety who plays like a buzz sauce, Jaden Hicks at Washington State. This guy is just zoom, 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 zoom. You want a guy down the road that I fall in love with is Malik Mustafa at Wake Forest. Because this guy just shows up, man. He brings a boom with him, makes plays on the ball. People may not have him as high as the other ones. But as you talked about, with only a couple second round picks, can you get deeper into the draft and find a guy who can play? I think Mustafa is one of those guys. Now, if we're getting into the corners, oh boy, you and I both know there's going to be a run on corners. Okay, it's going to be a run in the first round. And we're going to see it all happen. But now we got to get into past that. Who are the guys you like? Kamari Lassiter at Georgia, who's a borderline first-round guy who I think is going to get pushed to the second. And he's a quiet kid, but boy, he knows his, knows his stuff. And he's coming out of Georgia and has been well-taught and well-coached. And it's Rake Straw, another guy, borderline first round. He was in my last mock draft to go to Baltimore because of the way he plays the game with an intensity to him, even though his build is slight. He played like a Raven, as I like to say in my second mock draft. But again, he's a guy who's borderline who got, might get pushed to the second round and go play. And then right on down the line, you've got a ton of guys. Chris Abrams drained from Missouri, who's much more of a slot for me. TJ Tampa from Iowa State. Josh Newton from TCU. Um, you know, Shaw Smith Wade from Washington State is going to be much more of a middle round guy. But what's happening, John, is with all the increase in wide receiver play, You've got to have a counterbalance. So we've got to get more corners out there. And I've said it for three, four years now. If you're the third, fourth wide receiver on your team, see if you can backpedal. Because you might be end up being the first or second corner on your team with that athletic ability, and off you go from there. So it's going to be fun to watch as it all goes. But there'll be no shortage of corners that you'll want to take a look at in this draft. Safety's not quite as deep. And that's going to be the interesting part as Joe Shane and crew go through it about trying to replace the Xavier McKinney. Look, look at Julian Love is now in Seattle for the second year. You know, those kind of guys who gave you such good play back there, you got to want to get them because how many times do you turn on a ball game and you do it, John, you talk about that third safety playing as much as a nickel corner in these days. Yeah. And like a guy like Javon Bullard fits that, right. Who's kind of like part nickel corner, part he, safety. He, he would, yeah. he would be that perfect guy for that spot. He would. Him and Tyke Smith from Georgia as a collaborative crew. Bullard played more of the high safety, although he could drop down in there. Tyke Smith played more of the underneath that kind of what people call a star position or whatever each team calls it. But it was funny because when we were at the combine, both wanted to do the opposite. 
<laughs> to show right. the NFL I can do these things. And by the way, they can. Yeah, and Bullard's 40 time at the combine certainly helped him. He he, he broke that four yeah, five. Yeah. Spot Get our attention with it. No doubt. Absolutely. All right. So last question before I get your prediction at six, Charles, which I'm gonna hold you to, and you, and you better be right. Otherwise, I'm never gonna do this with you. I know, I know this will be the last time you speak to me. Um if the Giants go, don't go wide receiver at six. Maybe they go offensive line, maybe they go quarterback, whatever. The good news in reference to your last answer is that there are approximately a billion wide receivers in this draft that you can draft, and they're going to be good players. Now, they might not be number ones, but they can be a guy that can certainly help your room. So if this could be at any point in the draft, who are your two or three favorite non-top three wide receivers or even non-first round wide receivers that you think people are sleeping on and really have a chance to outplay where they're going to get drafted? Oh, man, I knew you were going to ask that, and I should have prepared even better. But it doesn't take me long to get there, okay? You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do it. Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, big, strong, physical kid. I really like him. And when he ran, you know, 4-4, a little bit sub 4-4, boy, he opened up my eyes on that one, okay? Um, Jamari Thrash from Louisville. Ooh, I like that. He can get up and go now, all right? And I just think that he just shows up plays makes plays and continues to make plays if you want to get a slot that i just crazy about is ricky pearsall from florida gonna play hard arizona state to florida transfer yeah we're gonna see the spectacular catch over and over and over how about the routine catches they just made the catch got upfield picked up the first down has some toughness to him to be able to go inside and make plays it's too easy but you gotta say luke mccaffrey from rice all right, just continues to just show up. You keep thinking to yourself, okay, I know it's bloodlines. Am I elevating him too high? No, I don't think so. He's going to be a good receiver for someone. Javon Baker, UCF, an Alabama transfer. Was in that Alabama receiving room. Tough, 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 right? He can get it done, and he's a really good player. We're starting to get into day three, I think, John. Yeah. He can flat out play for you. He can play in the slot especially. And if I want a guy on the outside that I'm going to take a shot at, I really want to take a look at this kid at Holy Cross, Jalen Coker. All right. Now he's more six, seven for me, but he's a big kid on the outside has made some plays. Holy Cross is a program that continued to get better over the last few years. It got so good. Their coach ended up getting another job. I think he ended up going down to James Madison, taking over there. So these are the types of players that I like catch my eye. I could go on and bore you with a whole bunch of them all day long, but there's so many, it's there's so many. many. It's crazy. I'm eager to see what people do with Devontae Walker in North Carolina because I think he and Keon Coleman both were rated higher as we started the process. But the sense I'm getting is they're rated lower now, but they're still really good football players. And I think Keon Coleman has a little more bounce to his game that maybe he's getting credit for. And Devontae Walker was getting nailed for one, you know, a, a bad, a really bad day, a couple bad days at the senior bowl. But boy, his production when you put on the tape and it's time to play is pretty darn good. And he and he, he didn't drop the ball during the regular season. I, I, that was one thing that I wanted to see him run routes. He actually did that pretty well at the senior bowl. He got open. He just couldn't catch the damn thing oh. for whatever reason. And sometimes, you know, it's like it's like the old you get on the merry-go-round and you just can't get off. And then that gets might have mental. Been one of those weeks for him, he just couldn't get off. But you're exactly right. You turn on the tape, it that no one ever came in there questioning his hands. So I I rely more on the tape for him than I do for the, the couple of days at the senior bowl in terms of catching the ball. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, final question, Charles. When all is said and done, and this is going to air for another four or five days, so maybe we'll know more before that, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What do you think the Giants end up doing at six? Because I got to be honest with you, I have no clue right now. I don't think any of us do, and, and Joe Shane and his crew are going to do another wonderful job in putting it all together. I just like that organization and what they do. But I just think that if you're going to ride with Daniel Jones, I think you kind of are right now. I just don't get the sense that they're going to go all in on the quarterback because I think there's going to be a lot of movement. There are people come in ahead of them to try and get those guys. So the and price is going to be really high if they want to move up. Yeah, right? it's going to be really high. And I don't think they're going to settle and go, well, we'll take the fourth or fifth quarterback. We'll be fine with that and start over that way. I, it just doesn't feel that way to me. I'm going to go with the kid out of LSU. I'm going Malik Neighbors. I have Malik Neighbors coming to New York. I love it. And, uh, Giants had some success with another LSU wide receiver that was pretty explosive on his first contract in terms of his numbers. So hopefully, and I think neighbors, it fits, fits that bill perfectly. Charles, this has been awesome. Promote anything you're up to, anything you're doing that, that, that you want to get out there and let the fans know about. 
Yeah, nothing for me to promote. I mean, I'm just a guy just trying to hang in there and keep up with you talking ball, trying to keep my notes going as I continue to move through this thing and learn some of these kids. It's been fun watching them play, putting them on, you know, seeing their tape go out there. And all I'm doing is wishing them the best of luck going forward because we'll be, you and I'll be talking about them next year on an NFL field. And won't that be fun to watch? Yeah, we want all these kids to succeed. Charles, we know how much you love this process. We thank you for joining us every year. Your pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You take care of yourself, John.